Hello, everyone, and welcome to the SNAPS COVID-19 Office Hours. My name is Michael Webster with Apt Associates, and I'm going to spend a couple of moments going over some tech notes, and then we'll get into the content that we have for today. A couple of housekeeping reminders. We are recording the Office Hours today, as we do each week, and we will post a copy of the recording along with the slides and any content that we receive through the chat box on the HUD Exchange in just a few business days. If you have any issues with audio during the webinar, we encourage you to switch over from computer to phone audio at the numbers that are on the screen and that I've just entered into the chat. Everyone will remain muted for the duration of the office hours this week, but we absolutely anticipate and hope to hear from you through the chat feature in WebEx. To find the chat, just take a look at the bottom right hand corner of your screen and you should see the word chat and what looks like a message bubble. Click on that to open the chat. Please send all questions, comments, and feedback through the chat. And with that, I'm going to turn things over to Norm Suchar from the HUD Office of Special Needs Assistance Programs. Norm? Thank you very much, Micah, and welcome everyone to today's session. Uh, we have a brief session today, but we have a lot to cover. Uh, we will uh, have our regular update from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Uh, Ashley Meehan will be providing that update. Uh, she will also provide an overview of monkeypox uh, for us today and uh, the things we need to pay attention to. Uh, we'll also have some updates uh, regarding a few different HUD notices or NOFOs you may have heard about. Uh, so we'll, we'll go through those as well. Uh, and we'll also have an ESG CV update. So we're going to just jump right into the content here. I do want to remind everyone if you have any questions or uh, anything you want to share with us, please do so through the chat window at any time. Uh, if you want to talk, uh, ask questions about the content today, that's great. Uh, if you have other questions, we will do our best to answer whatever we can. Uh, so thank you so much for joining, and with that, I'm going to turn things over to Ashley from CDC for our COVID update and monkeypox overview. Ashley? Thanks, Norm. Hi, everyone. This is Ashley Mann from CDC. Um, we can go to the next slide, Micah. Thank you. Um, so here's what we're looking at in terms of our bigger trend in COVID-19 cases over time. Um, so as more time passes, this graph just gets uh, harder and harder to read. So we can go to the next slide. And here we have it zoomed in from early March to um, earlier this week. And you can see that for about the last month, cases have um, been kind of stabilized or the number of cases have been kind of stabilized. Um, but I do just want to note that this does not include testing that people are doing at home. Um, you know, those aren't always reported um, and that's probably how most people are testing nowadays. So we do need to interpret this with a little bit of caution, but for the most part, it seems like the number of cases being reported to CDC is, is relatively stable. Next slide. So here we have our COVID-19 community levels map. Um, some counties are moving back into low transmission. So we see that the um, percent change in that uh, table on the right shows that about 3% of counties have moved back into that low green zone. Um, but we do see that Florida and some places out west are in medium and high community levels. Um, so you may remember back in April, um, this map looked a little bit different. We were seeing the Northeast in New York State um, that were orange and yellow all over. Um, and we can see that it's kind of spread west and south. So um, hopefully we'll continue to see more counties moving out of these high and medium community levels. Next slide. Um, I did want to highlight one publication that came out earlier this month um, around vaccinating veterans experiencing homelessness. Um, this team did qualitative interviews with healthcare and housing service providers, um, and they talked about some of the barriers and facilitators to vaccinating veterans. Um, and something that I really want to highlight is that they found that um, utilizing shelter staff and peers to talk about vaccination was really, really beneficial and, and really helped improve people's confidence in vaccines. Um, and I think it's just really important to highlight and acknowledge and recognize and thank all homeless service providers who have been filling this role and wearing these many different hats to support your clients. So um, 
just wanted to mention that if you're interested, go ahead and take a read, um, see if it aligns with your experience as homeless service or housing service providers. Um, and yeah, wanted to share that. Next slide. Um, and then the last thing, I forgot to put a slide in for this, but children under five can now be vaccinated against COVID-19, which is great news. Um, one thing that may be a little bit different about this is that um, you'll likely need to connect them with a pediatrician or some sort of other primary care office. Um, I'm not sure what appointment availability will look like at you know a standard pharmacy or CVS or something. Um, they often have children get vaccinated at um, pediatrician's offices. So um, definitely encourage clients and families if they have children under five to consider getting vaccinated. So that's it for my COVID update. Feel free to put any questions in the chat, um, but I can also pause and see if there are any COVID questions before I jump into monkeypox. Doesn't look like any questions so far. All right, great. Well, if you think of them, put them in the chat. Um, we can go to the next slide and get started on monkeypox. Um, so today I'll give a bit of an overview of monkeypox and what the current situation is. Um, CDC has been closely tracking some clusters of monkeypox cases recently reported in several countries that don't normally have monkeypox cases, um, including the US. Next slide. Um, so I, I wanna flag that there's a really, really helpful overview um, that was published earlier in June. Um, it shared about the original cases of monkeypox in the US and um, you know, what monkeypox is and how these initial cases were, uh, were first identified. Um, I found this really helpful as somebody who had no prior experience with this type of virus. Um, and I, I think it's pretty easy to understand for, for most of the general public. So if you're interested, go ahead and take a look um, but until recently, most monkeypox cases um, in countries where the virus uh, is circulating widely, um, they, I'm so sorry, let me back up. Um, there have been cases in the US recently from people who have traveled to countries where monkeypox has been circulating, as well as countries where monkeypox is not usually circulating. So there are a number of countries that are seeing cases of monkeypox, um, and that's kind of why we're keeping an eye on it. Um, so before I go to the next slide, I do kind of wanna give a content warning. Um, on the next slide, there will be some photos of what monkeypox lesions look like. Um, if you are someone who gets squirmish or feels kind of grossed out by um, dermatological images, feel free to close your eyes and just listen or put a piece of paper over the bottom half of your screen or look at something else. Um, you know, if you're sensitive to something with a bumpy texture, I recommend looking away. Um, so with that being said, make sure everyone has your eyes closed if you want, and we can go to the next slide. All right, so what is monkeypox? Monkeypox is a rare disease that spreads from animals to people and then between people as well. It's caused by the monkeypox virus, which is um, an orthopox virus. Monkeypox is a relative of smallpox, but has milder symptoms. It was first described and identified in 1958 um, in some monkeys. That's where the name comes from. Um, but then um, the first confirmed case in humans was in 1970. Um, it is commonly found in Western and Central African countries. Um, and that's where we consider it to be endemic or it spreads um, norm or usually. Um, in Africa or in African countries, the death rate can be as high as 11% in people who are not vaccinated for monkeypox, um, depending on the strain of monkeypox. We typically think of monkeypox as starting with flu-like illness, that's like fever, headache, muscle aches, you know, fatigue, um, and then within one to three days, um, usually a rash develops, um, historically beginning on the face or hands and spreading to other parts of the body. Um, and then the rash progresses over a few days to weeks. Um, so then it kind of turns into these sores or blisters. Um, and then they, this is kind of gross, I'm sorry, burst open and scab over. And then the scabs eventually fall off. Um, it's important to note that people can spread uh, the infection until all of the scabs fall off and healthy skin emerges. So there can be a pretty um, long time of infectivity. 
Um, people are usually ill for two to four weeks and most recover without specific treatment. Okay, next slide. So as of June 22nd in the US, there were 156 cases in 23 states and Washington, DC. Um, that's just for the US. Um, that number has already gone up in the last two days. I believe we're now around 175. Um, 175 cases. Um, you can find the map of where cases have been identified on CDC's website. Um, so in this specific image, um, the blue states are where cases have been identified. Globally, as of June 22nd, there have been more than 3,300 cases reported in 42 different countries. So um, we're seeing quite a few cases coming out of Europe. Um, I think the UK is leading in number of cases. Um, and so there have been some cases in the US that have been linked to travel to Europe. Um, and then people have come back to the US and, and develop symptoms. All right, we can go to the next slide. So how does monkeypox spread? What's the transmission of monkeypox? Monkeypox is spread through close contact, um, usually skin to skin contact with the rash um, or with a contaminated surface. So that can be through intimate or sexual activity, touching, cuddling, kissing, um, but also shared items like clothing or bedding or other personal care items or um, uh, anything that you may both touch. It's also spread through respiratory secretions, which usually require close face-to-face -face contact. Um, direct contact like kissing, um, you know, is an example of, um, you know, secretions in the mouth from breathing. Um, some of the cases first identified in May of 2022 were linked through sexual activity. Um, so that helpful overview that I mentioned at the beginning of this, that describes how those cases were identified in that early transmission. Um, again, it begins as a rash that turns into lesions that first open. Um, we're still looking at what infectivity looks like in the US right now. Um, and there are vaccinations and treatments available for monkeypox. Next slide. All right, so testing for orthopox viruses, and just as a reminder, monkeypox is an orthopox virus. Um, so previously, some work um, that had been done related to smallpox helped build capacity for testing for monkeypox. Um, the Laboratory Response Network, or LRN, has laboratories across the country and state and local public health departments that can test for monkeypox and other orthopox viruses. Um, currently, the only orthopox virus circulating in the U.S. is monkeypox. Um, so if, you know, a sample does test positive for orthopox broadly, it's going to be monkeypox. Um, when that happens, healthcare providers can begin contact tracing and treating folks as needed. Um, let's see. Okay, we can go to the next slide. Okay, so there are some vaccines to prevent orthopox viruses. Um, and in some circumstances, it may be recommended to get vaccinated after close contact with someone who has monkeypox. Um, that ultimately comes down to um, decisions with local public health and clinicians based on the person's risk for developing monkeypox infection. There are currently two licensed vaccines in the US to prevent smallpox and monkeypox, um, Genios and ACAM 2000. Um, Genios is an FDA approved uh, vaccine to prevent smallpox and monkeypox in adults uh, 18 and older if they're at high risk for smallpox or monkeypox. Um, it's made with a non-replicating virus, which is better for some populations. I'm not 100% sure what that means. Um, ACAM 2000 is an older vaccine used against smallpox disease, um, and that is uh, that's an option, but I think we're really trying to push Genios. You may have seen in the news recently that New York City was offering monkeypox vaccination widely, um, and CDC is thinking internally about how to strategize and prepare um, for wider availability of um, monkeypox vaccinations if needed. Next slide. There are two antivirals available to treat monkeypox and orthopox viruses. The first is T-pox. Um, it's an FDA approved antiviral to treat smallpox disease in adults and children. And then there's a vaccinia immune globulin intravenous or VGIV, which is licensed by the FDA for treatment of complications due to vaccination. Next slide. 
All right, so how is this current outbreak different from what we've seen related to monkeypox in the past? Um, so there are a few differences. Um, the first is that we are seeing a lot of cases in locations where we haven't seen cases to this extent before. Um, we're seeing a lot of cases in Europe and the US, um, which is different. Um, a lot of the cases that have been identified in the US, not all, but many, are among gay, bisexual, and other men who have sex with men. However, anyone who has been in close contact with someone who has monkeypox could be at risk. Um, last I heard that there were no deaths due to monkeypox in the US with this current, current transmission, but there's always a chance that that has changed. Um, the symptoms are also appearing a little bit differently now than they have in the past. Um, that, uh, there's a rash, um, I don't know who looked at it and who didn't, um, but that rash still looks pretty common. Um, but in this current transmission in the US, um, we're seeing it start in genital and anal areas um, rather than starting on the face. And that's because of this transmission um, during sexual activity. Um, so it's appearing in areas that sometimes might get um, misdiagnosed or misclassified as an STI, for example. Um, and then, the symptoms now are also a bit mild or um, they may not have these early signs like fever or fatigue where um, in the past that was pretty characteristic of monkeypox. Um, it's not really clear right now why we're seeing these unusual presentations. Um, we have a clinical team that has been looking um, very, very uh, intensely at why that might be happening. Next slide. All right, so a lot of efforts are being focused on clinical care providers right now um, to identify and test for monkeypox in clinics. Um, so as I mentioned, you know, this is um, has the possibility to be mistaken for STIs. Um, and so we're really trying to make sure that clinical providers um, know to be on the lookout for this. Um, but in the background, um, our team has also been working to put together some considerations for congregate settings. Um, so we have some considerations that are up available online right now. Um, it's not only specific to homeless shelters or homeless service sites. It also applies to other non-healthcare settings like university dorms or group homes or correctional facilities. Next slide. All right, so the summary of these considerations are going to look really similar to the recommendations that we had during COVID. Um, so I'll just run through some of the high level considerations we have um, for monkeypox for congregate settings. Um, the first is communicate with staff, volunteers, and residents um, as much as you can about monkeypox, what it is um, that it's circulating. Um, also respond to cases. So if there are people who have suspected monkeypox or some other rash or lesion, have them medically evaluated as soon as you can. Um, we're also going to benefit from isolating people with monkeypox. Um, I know nobody was a fan of isolation during COVID and um, unfortunately it's back again with monkeypox. So um, we really wanna make sure that people who um, do have confirmed monkeypox are separated from others in a congregate setting. Um, after people have been, um, identified and isolated, we also want to identify people who may have been exposed to them or around them to see who might be exposed to monkeypox or be considered a close contact and make sure that they're monitored and tested as needed. We also want to ensure access to hand washing, um, whether that's um, hand sanitizer or making sure that sinks are stocked with soap, um, that's going to be really important as well. Um, and then cleaning and disinfecting the areas where people with monkeypox spent time. If someone in your facility um, you know, ends up being a confirmed case of monkeypox, make sure that you're cleaning um, anywhere that they may have touched. And um, similar to COVID, if you have high touch areas, um, clean those just a little bit more frequently than usual. Um, and then provide appropriate personal protective equipment or PPE for staff, volunteers, and residents. Um, and I wanna flag here, even during laundry. So this is a little bit different than our recommendations during COVID. Um, but if you'll remember, um, monkeypox, it, you know, the lesions burst open and then they scab over and then those, um, scabs fall off. Um, and so they can fall on the ground, um, and then be kicked back up when you're vacuuming or sweeping or running fans. Um, and they may also be 
um, you know, like on or in clothing or in bedding. So if you have someone in your facility who's doing laundry or handling client belongings or doing, you know, this sweeping or vacuuming, um, they should be wearing PPE. Um, if, um, if somebody has had monkeypox in your facility, um, because as gross as this may be, they could inhale or ingest those particles, um, which have viral material. Um, so I did want to note that that is a little bit different than COVID, um, that we are recommending PPE for folks who are doing laundry or caring for other, um, other people who are caring for people who have monkeypox. All right, we can go to the next slide. Okay, that was a lot and uh, we're still learning a lot more about it, but if you have any questions, you're more than welcome to email. Um, the first email that says poxvirus at cdc.gov and CC our team's box, special populations at cdc.gov. Um, we're happy to do our best to answer any questions you all may have. Um, if you don't have any right now, but you think of some later, um, please email those boxes. Um, and if you have someone in your facility that you think could be could have monkeypox, um, definitely get them connected to care and then send out an email to us to let us know. And we're happy to help think through what to do in those situations. So. I'll stop there and see if there are any questions. Um, I'm definitely not an expert, but I will do my best to answer them. Thank you very much, Ashley. We definitely appreciate that because we've been he hearing a lot about monkeypox, but haven't really known what to make of it. Um, it sounds like most of the actions that a shelter or other homeless service provider should take are very consistent with the COVID uh, responses and and uh, protections that we have been, you know, got that we've gotten very used to. Uh, you mentioned that uh, laundry and and vacuuming and some dusting and some of the other cleaning activities uh, might require pr protective equipment uh, if somebody has been uh, diagnosed with monkeypox in the area. Are there other sort of things we should be paying attention to in in homelessness settings? around monkeypox or is it mostly just being vigilant about our, you know, the COVID uh, measures we've taken? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't, I don't think there's anything additional to be aware of. Um, you know, I think these general infection prevention strategies that, you know, we really started um, encouraging strongly during COVID, I think they are gonna apply to a number of different infectious diseases. You know, washing our hands uh, thoroughly and often can protect us from a number of different illnesses and viruses and infections. Um, so there's nothing really additional. Um, I did quickly wanna note though that um, with laundry, um, you don't have to wash it on a specific heat setting or with a specific type of, of soap. Um, just normal detergent and warmer cold water will be fine. So um, did just want to flag that as well. Uh, thank you. That's also extremely helpful. Great. Uh, if you have more questions for Ashley, please go ahead and type them in the chat window, or as Ashley mentioned, uh, please go ahead and send them to those email addresses uh, that we've put in the chat window. So with that, we're going to move on to our next presentation. Uh, HUD published a lot of stuff over the last couple of weeks. One of those things we published is an expedited waiver process. I'm going to turn things over to Ebony Rankin from uh, the SNAPS office to talk about what exactly that is, what it means, and how you take advantage of it. So Ebony, over to you. Well, thanks, Norm, and good afternoon, everyone. So last uh, Wednesday, um, HUD posted um, CPD 2209 notice, and that allowed for um, expedited process on certain waivers. And it, waivers are still to prevent the spread of COVID-19 and to help um, provide some economic um, assistance to communities uh, still impacted by COVID-19. And so um, these, this waiver is different than the waivers that we laid out in the notices that we posted in um, 2020 and 2021. The last of those waivers, as uh, most of you guys know, expired March 31st, 2020. It's important to know that the waivers that are granted from here do not extend those waivers that um, ended in March March 30th, 2022. They just, um, you just, because you have to request uh, new waivers for this. Um, 
You see, and, they, and what do we mean by expedited? Um, normally our waiver, the waiver process, you have to go through uh, your local HUD field office to, to submit a waiver request and they send it up through um, HUD headquarters to process. These waivers go directly to HUD headquarters to process and will usually take um, uh, a little faster than the normal weeks or months that we normally take to, uh, to um, process a waiver. Um, even though it's expedited, we still have the same scrutiny as regular waivers. So you may still get a request for more information, which could extend how long it takes for us to um, either approve or disapprove your waiver. So next slide. So the um, applicable waivers uh, this time, some of them are similar to the waivers you've seen in previous uh, notices uh, dealing with um, the prevention the uh, prevention of the spread of COVID-19, um, and then some of them are not. So for C COC and YHDP waivers, you have the suitable dwelling size and HQR standards uh, waiver for um, PH and RRH. And what this waiver would do, uh, if approved, uh, will allow recipients to assist program participants to move into housing with two or more people per room. Um, we have the FMR waiver for individual units and leasing costs, and this will allow recipients um, to use grant funds for rent above FMR, but the rent still um, has to be reasonable. It is important to note when we say leasing costs for this, because if you're, uh, if you're a grant that has uh, rental assistance costs, you're already allowed to, to use um, grant funds for rent above FMR. So this is for leasing units. Um, we have the one-year lease requirement, which uh, if um, approved, the recipients can execute a lease for a term of less than a year, but that lease would still have to be more than one month. Um, and the rapid rehousing limit to 24 months of rental assistance. So this will allow for recipients who've reached 24 months between the approval date of the waiver. So the approval date of the waiver is not the date that you submit it to HUD is the date that HUD sends you the letter via email saying that it's approved. So um, participants who reach 24 months of assist assistance between the date of the approved waiver and um, when you request that waiver to end can have uh, additional months of assistance. Um, and the additional months of assistance will not go past March 30th, 2023. And the last one for COC, YHDP, for um, disability documentation for um, permanent support of housing. And it just removes the confirmation of disability documentation timeline of 45 days. It allows for a uh, written certification by individuals seeking um, that assistance. Uh, uh, if they have written certification that they have uh, a disability that is um, acceptable. Um, for ESG, um, for assistant program, assisting program participants with sub leases, this would, uh, if you get this waiver approved, it removes the requirement that restrict participants from receiving rental assistance from the owner or owner's agent. So it opens up um, who the participants can receive uh, rental assistance uh, from. Um, Housing Relocation and Stabilization Services, it allows for assistance past the 24 month limit. And I have to uh, let you know that please read the notice on, on these because we do have other um, requirements for uh, these waivers. For rental assistance um, for ESG, it you know allows for assistance beyond the 24 month limit. And then similar to, to COC YHDP, the restriction um, of rental assistance to units with rent at or below FMR, this allows you to provide rental assistance for units above FMR, once again, as long as the rent is reasonable. Um, for HOPWA, there's three. Um, it waives the 21 week and 60 day limitations on stays in short term supported housing facilities. Uh, for space and security, it allows um, uh, recipients to place more than two people in a room, and it allows recipients to reconfigure rooms uh, for temporary quarantine services if necessary. Um, and then, of course, with the self-certification, it waives the requirement to have 
source documentation of um, HIV status at the time um, of determination of, docu of uh, documentation eligibility. So those are, these are all the um, applicable waivers for each of the three programs. Um, for the waivers will go to the same mailbox uh, for each program. So you don't have to worry about separating, um, sending it to different places. It all goes to one mailbox. Um, and now how do you request a waiver and what do we require? Uh, next slide. So our requirements. Uh, Please send a waiver to snapsinfo at hud.gov. Do not send it anywhere else. Please send it to snapsinfo at hud.gov. I promise you folks are definitely, we are definitely monitoring this mailbox uh, and we, we're getting requests um, in all day. So please send your request here. We have a, an example of um, in Appendix A of, that no, of the notice, we do have an example of, that you can use to put your request to, you can use to um, establish your request. Um, the subject line, please put the subject line as expedited um, pandemic regulatory waiver request. You don't have to add anything else to that sub subject line because what happens is that we get other, as you can imagine, other info from the SNAPS info mailbox. So to, the easier you make it on us to, to be able to sort your request, the faster we can see your request. And make sure you provide the recipient information. So this may not be the person who's actually sending a request, even though a recipient should be sending a request. So it should be the recipient information, which includes a contact for the person who is actually sending it on behalf of the recipient. The grant number or numbers. Um, if you have multiple grants but are using the same, um, asking for the same waiver, you can actually include multiple grants on one, um, one request. You want to include what your specific uh, waiver flexibilities are. We need to know what we're responding to, and please make sure your waiver flexibilities uh, make sense with the um, with the program you're actually requesting it for. And a justification for each waiver. And when I say each waiver is each uh, waiver flexibility, and make sure um, your waiver justification is not pithy, meaning that we need to have a robust um, justification. The impact, this, this could, uh, the impact um, that having this waiver or not having this waiver will do to your community, that can be included into your justification. And we do have examples of the justification in the notice as well, if you want to look through those. But please don't copy and paste the, the justifications, um, but you can use it to, to help guide you when you're sending in the justification to us. And you want to give us, ask, uh, tell us the duration of the waiver. So the duration of the waiver cannot extend past March 31st, 2023. It cannot start before we actually approve it at HUD. Um, we will have the date, the date of the letter of approval. That's when, when it'll start, but it cannot extend past March 31st, 2023. You can feel free to include that March 31st date if you want. If you're not sure you need that long, you can still include it. Um, but that's that's as far as it can be extended. And like I said, a template is provided for those who are wondering exactly how they should submit these uh, waivers. And if you submitted one already and haven't used a template, um, as long as you have the information that we asked for, that's okay too. Um, next slide. So some of the things we I, I have a reminder slide here because it's some of the things that we've seen so far um, in, uh, in our waiver request include a justification for each waiver requested. It's helpful not to have like a copy and paste one sentence justification. And remember, these are waivers to still prevent the spread of COVID-19 because we're still in a pandemic and to um, give assistance to those communities who are impacted by, you know, all the stuff that just, just the pandemic has impacted. So make sure you include in justification for each type of waiver you requested. Um, and for ESG grants, make sure you include your um, applicable subrecipients. We will need that information. So if you don't, we will likely come back and ask you for it, which will increase the time it takes for us to process. So ESG grants include um, applicable subrecipients. For COC grants, you do not have to include applicable subrecipients as long as we have your grant number for e um, COC grants and YSGP grants. We know what grant that that is. Um, 
applicable to. Um, and I've said before, waiver requests must be applicable to grant a component. We have one that allow um, you to use uh, rental, uh, rental funds um, for leasing above FMR. So if you have a rental assistance project, please do not ask for that waiver because it's not applicable to rental assistance, it's applicable to leasing. Um, so just make sure you double check that your waiver request is applicable to the actual grant component. Um, waivers are not retroactive. So they will, I said this again, they will start when we approve it and end at the either the date you choose that's before March um, 31st um, or March 31st. And I think a lot of people are just choosing March 31st, but they are not um, retroactive. However, for those, I know there are a lot of COC grants specifically and YHDP grants that have not started their FY2020, FY2021 grant yet. Um, so the waiver can apply to your FY2021 grant, um, even if you haven't, if you haven't gone to grant agreement yet, if that makes sense. So if you have a grant that's starting July 1st, you can actually ask for, for COC, if you have a renewal grant that started in July 1st, you can actually ask for a waiver um, and include that renewal grant in it as well. And you can include the 2020 grant, even though it's gonna only last, like if we approve it Monday, you only have like four days for the 2020 grant and then your 2021 could be kicked in. And if you're not sure, include them both and we can let you know if um, it's applicable to your 2021 grant. Um, and then the last uh, reminder, um, oh yeah, so I just literally said that. The waivers are available for FY 2021 grants that are waiting for grant agreement execution. And these are for the renewal grants that you know we're gonna get executed, um, but have not, um, just, they just haven't gone to grant agreement because they're not, uh, they're not, the previous grant hasn't expired yet. Um, so that is all I have. Uh, I, I see a lot of questions in the chat, and I think Brett is answering most of them. Um, so that's all I have, Norm. Thanks so much, Ebony. A couple of questions I just want to throw your way. Uh, some projects uh, or some recipients, especially in the COC program, have multiple grants. Uh, can they just submit one waiver request and list multiple grants in those, or do they need to submit separate waiver requests for each separate grant? They can submit um, one waiver for request for multiple grants. Um, they uh, they just need to make sure if the if they're submitting <clears throat> different um, different waivers that there's a justification for each waiver, but is. Uh, you can definitely submit um, one request for multiple grants. Great, thank you. Uh, and there was an important clarification in the chat uh, with respect to ESGCV. This way, this expedited waiver does not apply to ESGCV because these waivers are already covered in the ESGCV notice, and the ESGCV notice continues to apply to uh, ESGCV funds through the end of C ESGCV funding. Uh, so helpful clarification there. Um, okay, uh, and apologize for not having anyone from the Hopwell office on today. Uh, so we will try to get uh, answers about the HOPWA waivers uh, when we can. Um, thank you so much, Ebony. Uh, we're gonna move to the next part of our presentation, but if you have questions about the expedited waiver process or expedited waiver notice, please continue to submit those in the chat window and we will continue to do our best to answer the, as many of them as we can. Um, I'm going to turn things over now to Marlisa Grogan from the SNAPS office and Marlisa is gonna give us a bit of an update on the ESGCV program because we had an important deadline that passed a little few days ago. So Marlisa, uh, over to you. Okay, hi everybody. I wanted to give a specific thank you to ESG recipients and subrecipients for the hard work and the amazing progress that you all made uh, up until the, I think, the wee hours um, of the deadline. 
on June 16th. So you all really astounded all of us. Um, there are less than 50 recipients that um, did not make the 50% draw deadline, and over 300 of you that did, which is just amazing. So although we don't have uh, the graphs to show you, I just wanted to let you all know that you made some records over the last few weeks. Since the beginning of June, you drew down a total of 84 million um, the week that ended June 3rd, then 76 million the week that ended June 10th, and then you all ended the week ending uh, June 17th, that was the, the week of the deadline, having drawn down $98 million, so, so bravo. We're really, we're really encouraged by all the hard work and the dedication that you all put into it. And, uh, and also a special thank you to the TA providers who are listening. We know that you all were really pulling for all of the communities that you're working with and, and put in a lot of hours and trying to do everything you could to make that happen. So as a next step, we're working on, some, on notifying everyone to confirm where you stood as of the 16th, and we are also working on two webinars that should be that should be presented uh, in the upcoming weeks that will specifically target those who need some additional guidance on what it, what to do now be, if you're having funds recaptured, as well as steps to take in anticipation of the reallocation of funds. So we will have more information for you all on that. And with that, we'll turn it back to you, Norm. Thanks so much, Marlisa. And I just really want to echo Marlisa's uh, uh, sincere thanks to everyone who uh, who did set those record draws uh, for the past few weeks. Uh, it was just great to see. We have been following this daily, sometimes more often than daily. Uh, and we just appreciate, we know that it's a ton of work to get these draws made in addition to the fact that uh, it's a lot of work to implement all the programs under the ESGCV program. Uh, we know that these programs have done a ton of good stuff, uh, and we know that you all focus uh, the most on actually executing the programs and making sure they work for people experiencing homelessness, and uh, sometimes the draw work is not the funnest work. But uh, thank you so much for your attention to it, and uh, we very much appreciate your diligence about getting that done. And as uh, Marlisa said, we will follow up. If you do have questions, please feel free uh, to reach out to your uh, ESGCV desk officer um, or you know anyone else you happen to know at HUD, and we will do our best to answer those uh, as we can. And also, if you have any questions now, feel free to type those in the chat window. In the meantime, we're going to move uh, into another uh, update. So I have, I have a couple updates that I'm going to provide, so I'll turn it over to myself. Um, we have another deadline coming up, June 28th, which is next week. Uh, the YHDP NOFO closes. So if you're working on that, please uh, continue working. We're pulling for you. But uh, we that will close on, uh, on next Tuesday. Uh, and if you have questions, uh, there's information in the NOFO about who to contact. Definitely reach out to us. Uh, we are happy to help with any challenges or problems you're having, especially if there are problems related to getting the your application submitted. Uh, so very excited about that. We also, I think everybody noticed, hopefully everybody noticed, we uh, published a NOFO earlier this week for unsheltered and rural homelessness. So I want to pause for a second and just uh, just explain that this is a really important uh, NOFO for HUD for you know I think for communities we have been seeing increases in unsheltered homelessness for the past several years uh, in a lot of different parts of the country uh, and we've obviously been incredibly concerned about this uh, and this funding is really dedicated to. Uh, to uh, to addressing unsheltered homelessness. We know it's not all of the funding and resources that will be needed, but we feel like this is an important uh, watershed moment in, uh, in our work. Uh, if you have, we will be doing two webinars next week. Uh, so I wanna bring those to your attention. We will have one on Tuesday, 
that uh, will be focused on the unsheltered portion of the NOFO. Uh, and we will have one on Wednesday that will be focused on the uh, the special rural provisions uh, of the NOFO. Uh, the rural provisions are also obviously focused on unsheltered homelessness, uh, but we there are some unique aspects to the rural uh, parts of the NOFA and the rural funding in the NOFA, so we are doing a special session uh, for that. Uh, I don't think you really need to attend both of those uh, unless you're in a community that plans on applying for both the unsheltered and the rural portions of the NOFO. Uh, if you are, then please feel free to um, to uh, to attend both those sessions. Um, I, I again want to reiterate uh, how important this is. Uh, we are very much encouraging communities to leverage resources, mainstream housing and healthcare resources. And so uh, I think it's really important to start those conversations with your mainstream healthcare and uh, housing partners, including your public housing agencies, your uh, local housing funders, uh, the hospitals and other healthcare funders in your community. Uh, I think that's gonna be incredibly important and the sooner those conversations start, I think the better position you'll be in uh, to, to, to do well on the NOFA. The NOFA is going to close October 20th. Uh, so there are about four months. Well, I think it's actually exactly 120 days uh, to complete the NOFO. Uh, one thing I also wanna mention is that we will, this is different than the regular COC competition. We will also be publishing, uh, it, you know, coming up soon, a, the regular COC NOFO. Uh, and we don't know exactly when it will publish or exactly when the, uh, when it will be due, but there's a reasonably good chance, actually a very good chance that the COC NOFO, even though it publishes after, will actually be due before the unsheltered NOFO. So I just want to bring that to everyone's attention. Uh, again, we don't have all the specifics yet, but we will uh, try to get those to you as soon as we can. Uh, also want to mention that uh, the, the unsheltered and rural NOFO is for new projects. It will not fund any renewals. Uh, so want to make, you know, bring that to your attention. Also, those will be three year grants. Uh, so again, just want to bring a few things to your attention. Uh, but for all the other um, sort of details in the NOFO, we really just want to encourage you to uh, come to those webinars next Tuesday and Wednesday, and we will go into great depth uh, about those. Also, uh, if you do have um, questions about that NOFO, we do have a mailbox dedicated to the unsheltered and rural NOFO. It is, uh, the mailbox is in the uh, NOFO itself, but we will also post that mailbox address uh, or that email address, I should say, here. I uh, also want to bring to your attention the fact that we published GIWs uh, and send out a listserv message. I believe we sent the listserv message out yesterday, right around two, a little after two o'clock. Eastern time. Uh, so if if GIWs are important to you, uh, please uh, check on that listserv message and uh, start reviewing those GIWs. If you have any questions about that, again, reach out to us. Um, so the uh, last update I want to give is over the timing of these office hours, uh, COVID office hours we've been doing, we are going to switch to a monthly schedule for these. Uh, the next one of these will be held on July 22nd. Uh, we'll keep our Friday time slot, but we will go to a once a month schedule. Uh, we have a lot that we're gonna do in the interim, so we'll still have plenty of opportunities to have to you know, respond to your questions and to have conversations and give you updates. Uh, but these COVID webinars will switch to a once a month timeframe. Uh, so those are the updates uh, we have. Uh, I'm just gonna take a quick look at the questions and see if anybody has any questions. Um, we do have a great question uh, in, about why didn't we just combine this NOFA with regular COC NOFA uh, and recognizing the how taxing the NOFA process is uh, to communities. Uh, we are 100% aware of uh, how much work this is. Um, 
there are actually a lot of reasons we had to do this as a separate NOFO. Um, we did have a slightly different funding source for the uh, unsheltered NOFO. Um, also, uh, you know, we were able to give a little more time to work on the unsheltered NOFO. We thought that was really, really important. Uh, we do, uh, I will just say there, there's likely to be a lot of uh, similar questions uh, between the two NOFOs, the similar rating factors, uh, and hopefully that will streamline the process for you and it won't quite feel like two completely separate NOFOs or two no, you know, the work of two entire NOFOs that there will be some opportunities to streamline and co consolidate that work. Um, so, uh, let's see if we have any other questions. The office hours uh, will be, I believe we're doing them every four weeks on Friday. I'm not sure we've totally worked out that schedule, but it will be roughly the same time, time during each month. Uh, but we will clarify that on the 22nd when we get back together, because I don't know if we're doing, or maybe if Letitia happens to know the answer, uh, she'll put it in the uh, chat window here. Um, did have a question about the additional EH, uh, additional vouchers that were mentioned in the NOFA. Uh, I can say that we don't have any details about those right now, uh, but HUD is planning on publishing a no, no, sorry, a notice on those vouchers uh, later this summer. So stay tuned for that, and that will have uh, many more details. Uh, any other questions we have here? Sorry, when I'm talking, I just don't do a great job of reviewing the questions. Um, doo -doo -doo. I think that is uh, all the questions I feel like we're uh, ready to um, answer today. Uh, we'll take note of the other questions and try to answer them in the webinars next Tuesday or uh, Tuesday and Wednesday or uh, our next office hour session. But I do want to thank, um, thank you, Letitia, for clarifying that we'll be doing these the fourth Friday of each month. I do want to thank everyone uh, from the SNAPS office and CDC on the call today. I want to thank all our TA providers. I want to thank uh, all of our COC and ESG and other homelessness partners uh, for the incredible work you're doing. Uh, I know there's going to be a lot of work this summer with, uh, with NOFOs and everything else going on. So I want to say in advance how much I appreciate your work on that. Uh, and I think that wraps up everything for today. Uh, wish everyone a good rest of the day, great weekend, and that concludes the webinar.